This morning's scripture reading will be coming from Obadiah, verses 1 through 10. Obadiah, 1 through 10. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how will you be ruined? Would they not steal only until they had enough? If, if grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. All the men aligned with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who, they who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and, and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, dismayed O Teman, so that every, everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Because of, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. Good morning, brethren and friends. We're happy to see you here on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to assemble together and to study God's Word. We have a good number with us today, as has been mentioned, many guests visiting with us, and we're certainly thankful that you've come our way today, and we hope that you can come back and be with us at any and every opportunity that you might have. We're grateful to all who have led us in our worship up to this point. What a joy it is to come together on the first day of the week and to worship our Heavenly Father. If you'd like to, you can go ahead and Leave your Bible open to the book of Obadiah or maybe put your ribbon marker there. We're going to begin there. We're going to go back to the law books, Genesis and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then we'll come back to Obadiah to wrap things up. Jake read for us the first 10 verses. We're going to pick up in verse 10 and move forward for a moment to consider what's going on in this book. Now as you go through the book of Obadiah, it's a, it's a short book. It's among the minor prophets, the last 12 of the Old Testament. It's the only one-chapter book in the Old Testament. There are five one-chapter books in the Bible. Four of the five are in the New Testament. Philemon, and 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. The only one Testament, or excuse me, one-chapter book in the Old Testament is Obadiah. So it's a short book. It's a book like Jonah and Nahum, fellow minor prophets, that is written to a people who are not descendants of Jacob. Now, Obadiah, the people who's receiving his letter, his burden, now they are descendants of Abraham, but not of Jacob. Whereas Jonah and Nahum is writing, they're writing to, to Gentiles. They're writing to the people of Assyria. It reminds us that even though they were under the old law, and even though God had given his law to the people of Israel, as we read in the law books of the Old Testament, these other people, they still had a responsibility to obey God. Different than what the descendants of Israel had to do. Differences, no doubt. Perhaps Romans chapter 2 sheds a little light on what they were to continue in until the Lord gave us the church. Now there's no differences. We're all to follow our Lord's word, John chapter 12 and verse 48. But we see the, we see the problem beginning in, in verse 10. Well, the background to the problem, I'll say it that way. Really, the problem would be in the first four verses of the book. But the, the background of the problem... And, and I want us to notice as we study this, this burden against the people of Edom, this prophecy against the people of Edom, I want us to know a little bit uh, about the background and, and have an understanding because I think there's much that we can learn from it today of how we don't need to go in the direction that they went. We don't need to follow and do what they did. Let's pick back up where Jake left off in verse 10. For violence against your brother Jacob. Now, we're going to talk more about that in just a moment, but you know, I said that 
here, these people, they were descendants of Abraham, but they were not descendants of Jacob, like the people of Israel were. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. And that, that would happen. The time would come when this would be a, a nation cut off forever, to, to no longer be. You, you have some remnants of them in the, in, the, in the New Testament with the Herod family, but they'll be cut off forever. In the day, verse 11, that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. If you're taking notes, jot down James chapter 4 and verse 17. For him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Here, here God's saying to these people, look, this was happening to, to Israel, to Jacob, to your, your kinfolk, and you did nothing about it. God's very much concerned that we do not follow the law of the Levite and priest of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, they might make the argument that we're not like the thieves. We didn't beat this man. We didn't leave him for dead. We didn't take his stuff. But they were just as guilty when they did not help the man. When they saw the one lying in the ditch and they passed by on the other side, they're just as guilty as the as the thieves who did the physical harm to him. God's saying here in verse 11, look, they were being led away captive. You did nothing. You did nothing to help them. And oh, by the way, they're your family. They're your family. They're your kinfolk. You did nothing to help them. In verse 12, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor shall you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord upon all nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return, or your reward shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountains, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. So we, we see here the, 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 the background of the problem, the root of the problem. These people of Edom, these, the, these Edomites and and they're, they're not helping Jacob. They're not helping Israel. They're not helping those people. They're not doing good for them when they have opportunity to do good. And, and God's done with it. What you have to understand when you read the book of Obadiah, you have to read the long-suffering of God and understand the long-suffering of God. It's difficult to date this book uh, among those who are uh, specialized in that work and dating it. Even there is much disagreement. Uh, some would go uh, as early as the 800s BC and some would go some years later. With that being said, either way, by the time you get to this book, this burden against the Edomites, what they had been doing had been going on for a long, long time. That's something that we have to keep in mind and remember as we study the Bible is sometimes I think when we read these verses that might sound a little harsh. You're going you're gonna to throw them down? You're going to defeat them? Why would you do that? If we don't realize and remember and understand that some of this had been going on for centuries. So it's, it's not that we just see God ready to, uh, to, to be done with them. We see the long-suffering of God. The patience has run out. You know? he, he's allowed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And the same will happen to us today if we're not careful. Eventually the long-suffering will end. Eventually the patience will end. Eventually the opportunity will be over. So leave your ribbon marker there because we're going to come back. We're going to circle back around to Obadiah in just a moment. But we have to get a little background to understand what's going on. Look to Genesis chapter 25 beginning in verse 21. Genesis chapter 25. In the age of the patriarchs. You have the age of the patriarchs with Abraham being born and then Isaac to him. And beginning in verse 21... Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. 
in verse 22, but the children, she's having twins, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Here we go. Two different nations. Two different people. Two, two, two different descendants are going to build their nations. Two nations are in your room. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. I think Jake read that name for us a moment ago in verse 6 of Obadiah, the people of Esau. In verse 26, afterward his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Jacob, as you know, his name was later changed to Israel. He would have the 12 sons. They would become the tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, that which Moses was born into, that which Moses, the great lawgiver, would give them the law. And that's the, the focus of the rest of the Old Testament because Jesus would come through the, this family. So we see that here is Jacob and Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Go to chapter 36 in verse 1. Genesis chapter 36 and verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of Esau who is Edom. So there we go. There's our people. There's the, the Edomites, the people of Edom. That's who, that's who God sent Obadiah to to speak out against them. Now let's, let's move forward. We have to you know, kind of just to put this sermon together, we want to move forward. We want to move forward to Numbers chapter 20. We realize that Isaac and his wife Rebekah, they had twin sons. Jacob and Esau is how we usually say it because Jacob becomes the stronger. He's the one that's well known. But really Esau was born first. It's Esau and Jacob. Esau is known uh, as Edom. His descendants are the Edomites. Jacob is known as Israel. His descendants are the Israelites. Well, as you know, in the book of Genesis follows the people of Jacob... As you end the book of Genesis, there in Egypt, all is well. As you begin the book of Exodus, it's not. It's bad for them. Evil. The Pharaoh, the, 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 the king of Egypt, he's even, he, he's even murdering the male children when they're born. It's, it's really, really bad times for the people of Israel. So God, as you know, through the direction of Moses, will lead his people out of Egypt into what we call the wilderness wanderings. Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse 14, is key to our study in the book of Obadiah. As we consider the problem that we read a moment ago, verses 10 through 17 of Obadiah, we see the background of it. They were family. They were brothers. And we skipped over their personal problems. But you know it. You've read Genesis. You know their, their personal problems where Jacob deceived his father Isaac and he took the birthright, he took the blessing and Edom... Esau wanted, wanted to kill him for it, and he has a run for his life, and they're separated. You see some reconciliation a little later, but family problems can sometimes be the most difficult to overcome, can they not? And you see, for the rest of the history of these two nations, they're plagued with family problems. So Moses is leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and into this wilderness wandering in Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. There's our people. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we de dwelt in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the Lord, we heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. Now, the people of Edom, the Edomites, they were, they were in this mountainous range, known in the, the mountains of Seir. And there's just, just this narrow gorge that goes through it. And so they, with just a few in their army, could hold off an entire nation of people because they had the advantage of height up in the mountains. And, and, and so, so an opposing army, an attacking army, this is going to all be important when we get back to the book of Obadiah in just a moment. They have to go through. There's, they were really difficult for them to be able to come in and, and attack and come out victorious against the Edomites. They didn't have much room for battle, and plus the, the, they, could, they could attack them from high. The Edomites could attack them from on high. 
So what we see uh, beginning in verse 17, Moses says, Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through the fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Verse 18, Edom said to him, You shall not pass through my land. Again, these are, these are opposing countries, nations. I, I realize that in, in the people of Israel, they're a large people, they're a nation of people, but they don't even have a land yet. They have an army, but they don't have a land and, and they're numbering over a million people. But they, this is family. It goes back to Jacob and Esau. It goes back to twin brothers. And, and, and the response in verse 18, you, you're not going through our land. There's no way. We're not going to allow it to happen. If you do, verse 18, I will come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway. And if... If I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. We, we see here the, the people of, of Edom, and they're not showing kindness to the people of Israel. They're not, they're not allowing to help them in any way. They're not, they're not allowing them to pass through their land. They're wanting to do so peacefully. And they're saying, no, we're not allowing you. One more verse, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7 beginning. As you know, the people of Israel, they don't go through the land. They have to go another way, they're continuing in their wilderness wanderings. But in that, what you see is forgiveness in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 7 and 8. Sometimes people believe that, that forgiveness is just a New Testament concept. With Jesus and his, his, his death on the cross and, 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 and sacrificing himself for us. And sometimes people, people come away with that idea that, you know, grace, mercy, forgiveness, that's all New Testament. But not Old Testament. No, 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 no. That's all the way through. From beginning to end. The thread all the way through is love and forgiveness. Both in God giving it to his people, but telling his people to grant it to others. Even after the Edom, Edomites treat, treated them the way that they did, even after the Egyptians treated the Israelites the way they did, notice in Deuteronomy chapter 23, when the law is read for a second time to a new generation of people because of the sins of the first generation, they all died out in the wilderness. God says to them, You shall not abhor, abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you are an alien in his land. The children of the third generation born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. God's telling the people of Israel as we go back now to Obadiah. God's telling the people of Israel, look. Yeah, they mistreated you. Don't repay evil for evil. You know, they, the, the Edomites, the Egyptians, they mistreated you. They, 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 they should not have done what they did to you. But God is telling his people the golden rule, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Forgiveness, kindness, treating others the right way, that's all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. And it lasts till today and it will last for however long this Lord, this world shall, in, shall be. Go back to Obadiah chapter 1. So let's wrap it up now in Obadiah chapter 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Now we know who Edom is. Now we know a little bit about the background. Now we know the problems. Now we know the family history. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us go up against her for battle. Verse 2, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. Remember the long-suffering. Remember that it goes all the way back to the days of Moses. It goes all the way back to when they would not allow them to pass through their land. To when they said, if you do, we will attack you. And they would have attacked them and they would have been victorious at that time. It goes all the way back, as we've already read, to the days of them going into captivity. And the people of Edom not doing anything to help them. God says, I'm done with it. My patience has run out. The long suffering is over. In verse 2, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. 
Uh-oh, verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You see, the, the problem we read in verses 10 through 17 led them to being a, a prideful people. The pride of your heart has deceived you. They thought they were bigger than God. They thought they were bigger than the other nations. They thought that they could not be destroyed. No one can bring us down. Pride has destroyed many people. And it continues to destroy people today. It destroys individuals. It destroys nations. And it can destroy congregations. Look at Romans chapter 12 for just a moment. We'll go right back to Obadiah. New Testament book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. This is a verse I think about quite often when I think about pride and humility. In verse 3, for I say... Through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Not to think of myself more highly. When you think you're a no one, you need to be reminded that you're a someone. You're important. You're important enough that God sent his son to die for you and Jesus shed his blood for you. You're, you're someone. You are important. You're important to your family. You're important to society. You're important to the Lord's church that meets here at Wood Avenue or wherever you meet on a regular basis. But when you think you're a someone, you need to be reminded that you're a no one. When you start thinking it's all about you and I'm the most important, and I'm better than all the others. When the pride has filled, when you start thinking of yourself more highly than you ought, then it's time to be humbled a little bit. And that's what God is doing. If you go back to verse 3, You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is on high, you shall say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Here, here they are, and that, that goes back, as we've already read once in this book, and we're reading it again. It, it, it tells us it's a reminder of where they lived in these mountains of Seir, and they're up in the mountains. And they, they, again, they thought that they could not be overrun or defeated in battle. You, you dwell in the cliffs of the rock. You say, who shall bring me down? In verse 4, here's the key of it. Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there... I will bring you down, says the Lord. We need to be reminded of God's love. We also need to be reminded of his, of his justice, being a just God. And he'll allow it to continue for a period of time, giving us opportunity to repent. Eventually that time ends. We need to make sure we're always ready and prepared to stand before our Lord in judgment. Outside of verse 4, you might want to jot this note. You don't want the Lord to humble you. You don't want that to happen. And you certainly don't want it to happen on judgment day. Humble yourselves before the Lord, James chapter 4. Study it, know it, humble yourself before the Lord and draw near to Him, James 4, 8. He's giving us the space. He's giving us the opportunity to do it. We just must choose to do it. What can we learn from the, from the Edomites? What can we learn from our study? One, we can learn resolve issues as soon as they come up. Jacob and Esau should not have ever let it, let it get to the point where it had gotten. They should have never, never done that. But they did. And, and for the rest of history, their, their nation... Or hate each other. But when we have opportunity, like the Edomites, to do good, we should. For they passed up the opportunity to help Jacob. And they were given time, the long-suffering of God, to repent. And they didn't. And now God says, I'm done. It's his world. He can choose. We're going to sing a song of him encouragement this morning, song of invitation. As Jason comes and leads us, we, we want to ask you, are you fighting against God? Are you battling against Him?
Are you filled with pride? Are you filled with anything else that would say, no, I'm, I'm doing this my way rather than the Lord's way? We want to ask you to change this morning. We want to help you make those changes. You can come during the song and talk to us about it. And you can grab one of us afterwards and we'll talk to you about it well, however you're comfortable in doing it. We want to help you get from where you are to where you need to be to be in a saving relationship with God so you can go to heaven. So you can, so, so you can go to heaven so you can forever and always be with God. We want to help you to get there. If it would be your desire, please come now as we stand and as we sing.